We're in the TechCrunch studio today with Mike Maples, managing partner at Floodgate. Mike, welcome to the studio. Thanks for having me. So, years ago, you were in Austin, you founded Motive, went public, and you were looking for the next thing to do. And I think it'd be really interesting to tell us like how you came to the Valley and started Floodgate, because most people now know you and think, oh yeah, Mike started Floodgate, but there's actually kind of a windy path yeah, to get well, there. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and I guess I got intrigued by two things at the same time. So mm -hmm. first of all, I just got intrigued by what at the time was being called Web 2.0. Okay. And so I was watching all these things happen, blogs, user-generated content, podcasting, uh, broad catching, all these things. And I was just like, I'm sitting here on the sidelines. And so I've mm -hmm. got to get up to Silicon Valley. And then I got intrigued by the venture business. And I had no idea that you didn't just apply for a job in the venture business. So yeah. I naively thought, well, I'll just, I'll just immigrate to Silicon Valley. Because you founded a company and it went public. Yeah, and, and I, yeah. Thought, I thought, you know, it's like any other job. You just, mm -hmm. you say, here are my qualifications and hire me. And mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's not how it really works. You know, I'd mm -hmm. never made an angel investment in my career. I'd never done a consumer startup, you mm -hmm. know, so. Uh, my profile as an investor was not very encouraging, it turns out, in hindsight. Okay, so what did you do? Like, okay, you moved to Silicon Valley. What are the first yeah. things you tried to do, or what did you work on? Well, well, I was lucky enough that two venture firms gave me some time to spend inside their firms. So okay. Foundation Capital and August Capital. Okay. And I think a lot of the insight for the micro fund I had while I was there at those two places. And so I saw a plethora of entrepreneurs who wanted to raise just a million dollars. And if you have a $500 million fund, you just can't make the math work investing a mm -hmm. million dollars. And so, so I thought, well, what if you had a $25 million fund? Uh, then if you made 25X, you return the fund on a million dollar investment. Yeah. And so that's where the seeds of the micro fund were born. And so uh, that's when I started to get intrigued by the idea. And the fortunate thing is being inside of two firms, I had enough data points to, to have some conviction that I was on to something. So you, you originally came here and thought that, hey, I want to be a venture capitalist, let's say on Sand Hill Road, right? With, with and and basically, you were told no twice. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I was I did not distinguish myself well enough inside of those two firms yeah. to be offered a partner role. Right. But I never really looked at it that way. I looked at it like okay. I was thankful that they gave me the time. Of course, and, of course. You know, they were awesome to me. And, right. And, and uh, yeah, I that also a ton. sowed the seed for, uh, as you were saying, no pun intended. To, to see a gap in the market, right? Right. So how did so tell us a little bit about how you started forming uh, Floodgate or what became Floodgate? Yeah, well, a couple things were happening at the same time. So first of all, uh, I had no track record as an investor. Mm -hmm. And so I just decided the only way anybody's gonna ever think I'm an investor is if I invest. And so I started investing my own money, uh, $50,000 a quarter. Okay. And I said, I'm gonna do this for 12 quarters and I'm gonna either hit some winners or I'm going to declare it a strikeout failed experiment. So my first investment ever was Odeo, uh, Evan Williams, and I was begging him to let me in uh, because he had no reason to, to accept money from a washed up enterprise software guy from Austin, Texas. Uh, but he took, he took some of my money. Why do you think he took some of your money? Um, I think we just had a good chemistry and I think he knew that I was a real entrepreneur and hadn't just played one on TV. And so, uh, mm -hmm. so I, and, he, and he knew that I was passionate about podcasting, and I'd spent a lot of time really understanding his business. Got it. And so, so we got into that one. Well, that didn't work out, right? So right. Odeo goes out of business, and Evan gives the money back to all the investors. Mm -hmm. So nine months into Silicon Valley, I'm like, I can't get a job in the venture business. I've made one investment. It seems to be going sideways. Yeah. Yeah, I was feeling kind of like a loser. And, uh, and then I met Kevin Rose at Dig. And it was the same thing. I, I said, Kevin, if you don't let me invest in Dig, I just have to warn you, I'm going to go on a hunger strike in your apartment. And so, <laughs> which I guess was an unusual tactic yes. at the time. <laughs> uh, so, so I invested in Dig. But if it weren't for Evan and Kevin, I'm not sure mm. that I would have gotten enough momentum to ever really raise money or ever. I'm not sure I would have ever gotten into first gear. Yeah, and it's off. It, kind of like you were saying earlier, it's the it's those entrepreneurs and founders really who sort of create opportunities for people like you and who are starting those companies. Yeah, starting these kind of funds, and it's me. funny, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about how well the entrepreneur succeeded because of their own gumption, but also those early venture guys that believed in them and backed them. And we were almost started in the reverse way. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we sort of, the, the entrepreneurs and their generosity and their belief that we could make a difference in a contribution gave us the chance to get some runway and a running start. Mm. You know, so, and we've never forgotten that. So Ann and I, when we, when we think about how we practice the business, we're always like, we have to remember 
that the entrepreneurs had our back when the chips were down. Right. So, and, and another story you mentioned that kind of ties into that, right? So yep. I think it'd be great for the audience to share just a little bit about sort of your investment in Chegg or yep. the guys who started Chegg. I don't know if it was called that before. Yep. And you, you were saying you, you knew them for about 18 months yep. and they were about to turn off the lights and they came to you with an idea, right? And re really no one at that point would probably invest in them, right? Well, so yeah. well, now looking back on that, you know, share a little bit about the narrative, but also what you learned yeah, that. so 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 I met uh, Ayush and Asman when they were relocating to California from the Midwest. Okay. So this Chegg had started as Chegg Post at Iowa State University. Okay, and it, the original idea was we're going to be Craigslist for college, and uh, college is the ultimate local market. So yeah. we we tried that for about eighteen months, and we had moderate success. Well, then Facebook decides they're going to do classifieds, and we're like, okay, we've got. 60 days of cash left yeah. and Facebook succeeds, we're out of business. If they fail, we're out of business and we're sure as heck not going <laughs> to raise money on this idea. Yeah. And so we had been batting around this idea of textbook rentals for a little while, for about six months, but we decided we couldn't afford to do it because mm -hmm. you'd have to buy books. Well, so Asman and Ayush are like, well, what we need is just 90 days to try it. And, and w w all we want is a, is a chance to try the fall semester. And so, so we, we, they started this thing, originally it was called Textbook Flicks, which clearly wasn't going to fly as a long-term name, but we just wanted to try yeah. it and see if it would work. So we tried this Textbook Flicks thing, and we, uh, we, we didn't even have a warehouse, so we, whenever somebody would rent a book, we'd ship it from Amazon, and these students would be calling us, and they'd say, what's, you know, what's up with this book from Amazon? And, and so we'd say, oh, just ship it back to Chegg. <laughs> you know, this is no problem, just a clerical error. So, so, before, so, yeah. so before you you made this decision to, to back these guys in this 90-day yeah. sort of all-hands-on experience, how closely were you working with them up until that point, right? Like, I know you had spent 18 months with them. Back in those days, it was pretty close because, yeah. you know, Chegg was my first investment in my first fund. And so, um, you know, one might say I've had a pretty good run of beginner's luck, right? Because yeah. Odeo turned into Twitter yeah. and Dig, you know, sort of went sideways. But Dig was a great investment to be part and of. Great for a group long time. of people. Great right. group of guys. I mean, I, I met the NG Moco guys because of Kevin Rose introducing me to Neil Young and Bob yeah. Stevenson. So, uh, you know, it was a great project to be involved with. And then Chegg had the biggest early near-death experience yeah. and but but it but i was fresh off of just staring you know the jaws of defeat in the face myself in terms of fundraising and being a vc and so you know it's only over when you decide to quit and then, so, then do you think yeah. that in in today's climate so that was a number of years ago that people would make that kind of investment or would they, they now shut it down and start something new or do you see that kind of stuff happening or hearing I, about it i don't know i guess all i can say is that uh People ask me what, what is the most fun thing about the venture business. Mm. And obviously, Twitter taking off like it did has been huge fun. Or yeah. when NG Moco set a world land speed record to $400 million exit, that was really fun. But yeah. the most satisfying ones are the ones where we were staring death right in the eyes. And it just seemed like there was no way out. And you had to MacGyver some miracle just out of the ashes. And you had right. no time left. Right. And you know those are the ones where you say, man, if we hadn't all gone all in together, there would be no Chegg to discuss. And so I'd say th those are the most satisfying, the ones where the chips were down, it looked like there was no way out, and somehow we just MacGyvered a miracle. And so I think that's, that's a good area to transition into, like, how did, you know, how did you start Floodgate, right? You're investing your own personal money in Odeo, uh, Chegg, and then how did you decide to actually go and ask other people for money, yeah. right, and institutionalize this idea you had at Foundation in August. Yeah, so, so at first I thought that, that no respectable, you know, people would ever invest in me other than folks who I'd known from the past. Okay. And so there were some guys down in Texas who believed that, that, that I could make some waves up here. Okay. And so I raised about, well, it was an unconventional fund. It was, mm -hmm. I would raise $5 million a year. Okay. And basically I was like, you guys can back out at any time. Okay. And I might decide I'm a crummy investor at any time. And so, you know, we did two $5 million tranches. And uh, by, by the end of the second tranche, it was clear things were working, right? We were in Chegg, we were in Demand Force, we were in Reputation.com. Uh, Sendori was about to have an exit. Uh, we, it, Weebly was doing really well. And so Fund One was, you know, an epic fund for the ages. And so 
now all of a sudden the mainstream institutional investors. But you started this. very small, right? Very small. So let's walk it was through. Just like, me, yeah. Right. Like let's just walk through the mechanics of like, how did you start it? How did you go out to raise money? Like how did you decide on five million tranche? Right. How did you yeah. go out and source things? Uh, yeah. when A lot. You so, may, maybe you knew some yeah, people, so, but not a lot. So fund one was defined as that which I can raise in thirty days or less. Okay. And so I saw all these guys out trying to raise funds, and they would put $25 million on the cover or something like that. And they'd be raising and raising and raising. And, mm -hmm. and pretty soon you get the stink on you because you can't raise the money. Yeah. And so I was like, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to tell a bunch of people, I'm not sure I know what I'm doing. Uh, invest an amount of money that you're prepared to lose it all. And, um, you know, and yeah. Austin Ventures, who had backed Motive and had backed Tivoli before, put a lot of the money in. And I guess I'd been involved with things that had made them money before, and so they they gave it gave it a risk. Got it. But it, but it was, you know, I don't want to be fundraising. I want my fund to be done before people know I'm fundraising. Yep. Uh, and I didn't have like yep. I was subleasing space from Rocks Row Pharma, so I couldn't I couldn't have a <laughs> sign on the door. So I used to call it my undisclosed secure location. And, and so, how did you go out? And I mean, I guess you were uh, sourcing when you were at. Uh, foundation in, in August, but like, how did you find it going out without a brand? You were just Mike. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you find that it was just all personal relationships? Did you have to kiss a lot of frogs? Like, how? What was it like in those days? Yeah. So in the early days, uh, I decided this is a people flow business and not a deal flow business. And mm -hmm. so, I've always had this leap of faith that if you just spend all your time with smart, awesome people, that the dots will forward connect and that deals will reveal themselves and somehow you'll get into mm. some good ones. Mm. And so that's what I, I would say, two meetings before lunch, two meetings after lunch every day. And so I just did that over and over and over again. And I just wanted to get in as many reps as I could. And at the end of the week, I would say, how many of these people are awesome and smart? And how do I increase and improve my ratio next week and the week after or the week after? Mm -hmm. And you're, when you're meeting the smartest people in a given area, uh, you know, at that time it was the consumer internet, you're eventually going to learn a lot yourself and you're going to have something to contribute to the conversation. And so I would keep a set of notes about some themes that I thought were interesting and I would share them with the entrepreneurs and see which ones they agreed with or disagreed with. Mm -hmm. But there was no doubt in anybody's mind that I spoke with that I really cared about the space in a visceral way. Yeah. And I think that helped. Got it. Yeah. yeah. That kind of And kinda, I think also back yeah. in those days, there were no other micro funds other than maybe first round capital. Actually, or, I was going to ask you, you about know. this next, which is if you time shift everything and you sold Motive last year, right? Yeah. And you moved here now, you know, it'd be really, really different, right? Because you were kind of one of a few right. doing this kind of model, right? And so now, um, I guess I guess I would ask like more reflectively, what would you think over the last few years has been the biggest change, right, that you've seen across the venture model? Let's say from institutional or micro yeah. uh, angel VCs up up to the big guys. Yeah, I would say well two things. So in the in the micro space, I would say that it's gone from being undersupplied to oversupplied. Yeah. So you know I think part of being a good investor, having a good company, is you need to find. You need to have an insight when the world believes the opposite of that. And so guys like me and Josh Koppelman, when we started micro funds, people said things like, well, people have tried that stuff before. It doesn't work. You're going to get creamed. You're not going to have enough capital. Consumer Internet's all about eyeballs. You know, it, you, you weren't here for the dot-com meltdown. And so it, nobody really cared what we were doing back in those days. Mm. Everybody thought we were kind of stupid, you know, wildcat or fly-by-night sort of guys. And so now everybody wants to have a fund. Everybody wants to be a seed investor. Everybody mm -hmm. wants to have some variation of yeah. being early stage. And so I think it's been oversupplied. And then if you, if you step way back at the macro factors of the venture industry, mm -hmm. right now I see sort of a bipolarization. And so right now people seem to think that seed deals and chasing the next Pinterest with a lot of money and momentum Right. Are, the, are the hot places so to let's, be. So let's unpack those real quick sort of as we end. So one is if there's an yeah. oversupply of seed capital, right, what, what are the things you believe could happen as a result of that? Or will that just sort of be this is the new normal? Um, well, I just think that it's kind of the circle of life. You know, sometimes there's mm -hmm. too much, sometimes there's too little. So you feel like it's cyclical? Totally. Got yeah. it. And then in terms of this, um, on, on the bipolarization side, in terms of a lot of capital in a small number of funds, you know, chasing momentum deals. 
what do you think could happen as a result of well, all that? Well, I think the venture business reminds me a lot of um, nine-year-olds playing soccer. Oh, boy. Right? So, <laughs> you know how when you see nine-year-olds play soccer, the soccer ball goes and everybody goes after it, and then, yeah. it, and then it squirts out, and everybody goes after it, everybody goes after it. Yeah. And so, like, what I find in the venture business is everybody's always really excited about the topic du jour, whether it's seed funds or super angels or mm. micro this or... Uh, you know, what Yuri Milner was doing a couple years ago with DST, Y Combinator accelerators. And so what, what ends up happening is that's the soccer ball du jour. Everybody, somebody like Paul Graham deserves all the props in the world for yeah. doing a righteous job and having a great model. But now there's, I don't know how many hundreds of accelerators. Yeah. And so, you know, those, most of them are nine-year-old soccer players, right? And so what I find is the venture business has a tendency I would have thought that it was more evenly distributed where people invest, that there's more contrarians and things like that. Mm -hmm. But in the end, I think most people follow the soccer ball right where it is. They, mm -hmm. they do the nine-year-old soccer chasing thing. Got it. Yeah. Interesting. Well, and my, so next, oh, you know, next yeah. year there will be a new fad du jour that everybody's chasing. And you know, people get all excited and emotional about it, but it'll just be, mm -hmm. it'll be the latest place where the soccer ball scores. Yeah, it sounds like the perspective you're sharing in closing, that's a perspective that someone would have who hasn't spent a lot of time here, like you're still relatively new to the Valley, right? So you yeah. have that perspective. Yeah. yeah, and I think that the the key to being a good investor is not to chase the latest thing, but to sort of be your best self and to, you know, to, to have conviction that you have something to offer in your space. And, yeah. and when, you, when, when you spin your wheels, it's when you get away from that. Yeah. All right, well, Mike, thanks for coming in and sharing all those stories. It was great to have you. Thanks for having me. All right. Great to see you.